this is interesting to be having such high detections in tongue tips um, because tongue tips is a, is a mix of what is in the mouth what is it, and what is in the, in the environment. Uh, of course, we have saliva, some blood in the mouth that can help us detect certain pathogens, not all of them, but certain, yes. But the environment is, is a reflection of what is and maybe what was. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. Joining me in our podcast studios this week is Marcelo Molini. Marcelo is a grad research assistant and PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota. Marcelo, thanks so much for coming on to the show. If you would, why don't you start out with a little introduction for the audience? Well, good morning, Clayton, and to the audience. Well, I'm, Mar uh, as you mentioned, Marcelo Molini, currently in the University of Minnesota working with PERS, and I hail from Guatemala, where I got my DVM, and then I pursue a career in the industry and in the public sector. And while I was working, I also got my master's degree in applied statistics. And right as, uh, as, I, I, as I was about to conclude that master's, I got uh, into the PhD program here in, in the University of Minnesota. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. Excellent. Well, congratulations. And I know you're doing some good work there at the university. Uh, you've been working on a chick sponsored program where you're looking at tongue tip fluids in the growing pig herd. And we know they can be used for PERS, but we think about that typically at the sow farm. But it sounds like you're looking at growing pigs and, and not just at PERS, at other pathogens. Talk to us about your project, Marcella. Well, that's right. So we had that this chick sponsor project, and we wanted to assess during a first outbreak in the grow finishers, can we test for something else? Because uh, we have the, the tool that is being explored right now in the breeding herd, but what happens if we don't want to collect only oral fluids? Because past the stage, uh, once they're weaned, uh, we don't uh, possess the, the processing fluids, right? That's beyond the stage. So we rely on only oral fluids, but although they are a good uh, tool to diagnose, uh, to monitor uh, PERS, sometimes they come short regarding sequencing, for example. So we want to assess other things that contain maybe other components in, in the sample. So we chose, okay, tongue fluids is a big thing or is uh, gaining some strength in the industry. We want to assess for this type of population. But then we say, okay, purse, yes, it's a big thing always in, in farms, but there are also other pathogens that we could explore just to assess if we could detect them. Um, some, we, we chose some that may be enteric, respiratory, or systemic. So we said, let's go towards PCV, which was PCV2, PCV3, parvovirus one and two, Lausonia and influenza um, A, and say let's test at specific points. So we chose, okay, let's go at three sampling points during uh, an outbreak of uh, PERS. Uh, so we chose, okay, one or two weeks after the, the outbreak, and then a couple of weeks later, and then a couple of weeks later when they're growers. So we said, okay, five weeks of age, 11 weeks of age, 15 weeks of age. There is a, an issue when we choose this type of sampling point, sampling points, which is, uh, okay, the outbreak starts, the presence of mortality is high, we can collect samples easily. But as, as per stabilizes, there are no more mortality, or the mortality is very low. And we want to assess the tongues or other postmortem samples as well that we included, we wanted to test them individually. So that was a challenge. 
our sample size was 30 per visit. So for the first visit, it was okay. It, we, we can collect it. Uh, the vet was saying we have some that are dying by themselves or we're utilizing some low viability pigs. Now for the second visit, it's okay. Uh, maybe from the days, one day before and the day of the visit, we just met the 30 uh, samples. But then as we, we said, okay, we're going in four weeks, we call the vet and say, okay, how are the pigs doing? The vet said, you know, stable now. There are no low viability. They're all gone. And there are no more mortality. Like, okay, that's a new challenge. How do we go to the 15 weeks of age? We, you had to enroll a second part that was just breaking with that age. So that, again, a new opportunity. We were able to sample um, at that moment. And the results are, I think they're interesting in the sense when you compare uh, sampling close to an outbreak compared to the one at 11 weeks of age, which was towards the stabilization of the herd, it behaves differently uh, in this, uh, when comparing sensitivity and specificity for PERS. Now, for the other pathogens, the behavior is, can be quite, I wouldn't say random, but uh, for some you, we can expect and for the others not. So let's take a look of PERS. So we said, okay, besides tongue tips, Let's collect others to compare because we can take the opportunity of having uh, the body as uh, bigger compared to uh, uh, pre-winning. So we said, what is easy also to collect because we want to keep a track not only for these pathogens, but maybe down the line for um, monitoring for absence of ASF, CSF, or others like those. So we also want to be able to collect samples that don't require a lot of training, don't require, require a lot of blood spillage. So we said, okay, besides tongue tips, let's assess uh, intracardiac blood. Just, we don't have to open anything, just a long needle collected and that's it. Then let's do some oral nasal swabs and uh, let's collect also some superficial inguinal lymph nodes. Those are Easy to see, everyone can collect them. You can open just by uh, opening the skin, you can see them, pull them, and, and that is, there's no blood around it. That's a, a, a good thing, I, I think, especially with these big, big pigs again. So we chose some of these specimen types for specific pathogens. So we said, let's put uh, the serum from the intercardiac block for PERS as our gold standard. Uh, against the rest, or nasal, the uh, lymph nodes, and the tongue tips, and the rest specific tongue tips against something easy to collect for them. So for the first visit, at five weeks of age, first we could detect it everywhere. E everyone was positive. That was no surprise. Um, as it, it began to stabilize, we see this decrease on positive uh, specimens. But one that was persistent was the superficial inguinal uh, lymph node, which was almost, well, almost 100%, was 97%. Meanwhile, the, uh, and the tongue tips were at 87% detection, so some performed better than others. Um, then for PCV2, the lymph nodes performed better than, than the tongue tips in some cases. But at the tower stabilization, PCV2 was present in 90% of the tongue tips and just 27% in the leaf nodes. Then we couldn't uh, detect positives from PCV3. But for, for example, PPV2, again, tongue tips, 90% 90, 90 in some cases versus 73% in uh, rectal swabs. Lausonia, we just could detect it uh, once in tongue tips. Influenza, when we found it, just in, in, in one sampling point, everything was positive. Tongue tips and, and swabs. So to me, this is interesting to be having such high detections in tongue tips. 
um, because tongue tips is a, is a mix of what is in the mouth what is it, and what is in the, in the environment. So, uh, of course, we have saliva, some blood in the mouth that can help us detect certain pathogens, not all of them, but certain, yes. But the environment is, is a reflection of what is and maybe what was. And um, maybe can in, uh, introduce some noise in the sense that some of these pathogens last long in, in, in the environment, right? PCV2 has been described that can be present without pigs and can be detected. Lausonia, the same thing. PPV, the same thing. So so it's also interesting to me to, to maybe it's not only for monitoring the diseases that um, the pigs have at the moment, but maybe also to monitor what is in the environment. Maybe the pigs are coming negative, placing the barn, having contact with these contaminated surfaces, and then they are becoming positive and shedding down the line the virus. So it's a cycle that is kept in the environment. I I I do like that some people are saying, yeah, tongues are more of a reflection of the environment than what the pig has, either in, in viremia or shedding. Um, so, so that's pretty interesting. Uh, going back to tongue tips for for purrs, um, sequencing uh, for sequencing, they're a good option. We sequence uh, sequence a couple of samples, both were positive. Then say, okay, let's try to sequence the rest of pathogens, and we chose just uh, out of curiosity. We said, let's choose the one the, with the highest. CT value, the one with the low CT value to see if we can detect. Some cases both were detected and others nothing. Um, others, uh, I think one PCV2 was just with the lowest one. But again, that's interesting. And there are other options that maybe we could test for sequencing such as the leaf nodes or others and have a comparison point. Uh, we did not do this maybe down the road, that's a good option. The other thing that I want to clarify from this study is that we did individual tongue tips, individual samples. We didn't do an aggregated one. If we want to monitor PERS or other pathogens, maybe, well, we won't do it submitting this test individually. That's uh, very costly. What we can do is, as has been described, just as an aggregated sample of the week. So maybe we are past an event of high mortality. Maybe it's not birth, maybe it's influenza, maybe it's with something else that is causing high mortality. We are past that. And we have a couple or five a week um, in the growth finishing phase. We could pull them, just um, collect them, store them, store them, and then submit them. That, that, that's an option. We didn't explore the, them as an aggregate sample, just as individual sample to see if they um, had the same level of detections. Again, some cases they do, some cases they don't. So I think tongue tip fluids are a good option for monitoring. Maybe we cannot assess the prevalence uh, at that point in the farm, but we can definitely have uh, like an x-ray of what is present in the farm. Yep, easy sample to collect. Um, to your point, it can be sequenced if you're looking at PERS specifically. And I think it's something that's applicable uh, to producers in the field now with PERS and maybe even in the future uh, if we have to monitor for, say, a disease like African swine fever or something like that. Um, can be done at the farm, can be done at the slaughterhouse, lots of different points of collection. Excellent information, Marcelo. I really appreciate you sharing that and coming on the show. Well, thank you for the invite. Yeah. Well, it's only possible, Marcelo, because of our audience. So for those of you out here listening to the podcast, thank you for doing so. Uh, Marcelo and I have done our job. So uh, you take a moment now, audience, and share this podcast with somebody else. Um, uh, also, take a moment, if you would, and go to our website, swinehealthblackbelt.com. There you can check out not only this episode, but all of our back catalog. Um, we certainly welcome you to dig through that. Lots of great research that we've covered through the years. Uh, for Marcelo Molini, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. 
Johnson. It's been our pleasure to have you on the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast. Thanks for spending some time with us and please have a great rest of your day.